Okay, we're live on all three, Steve. So we got about 16 seconds before we begin. You start on time and you stop on time. <laughs> The Word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and tents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, rightly dividing, dividing the, the word, word of truth. truth. And we always say that the spiritual, spiritual spin, spin stops right, right here because we really care, care for you. Go ahead and pray for us, Steve. Father, we thank you for the privilege and the freedoms as we reflected on that this past Memorial Day that we have to teach your word and study your word and share your word. We ask that those freedoms be continued in the days ahead, be with those who make the decisions to protect our freedoms. We ask your blessings on them. And we do ask a special intercessory prayer for Wilma Bonds tonight yes. after her operation, that she can heal quickly and effectively and, and live a better life. And we just pray your hand upon her. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Steve and folks, we're going to begin uh, our study tonight in actually part four of the concept of the protocol plan of God. And I'm telling you, this is an awesome study. They're all awesome. But I, heck of it. How about this? Is this an English word? Awesomer? More awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. This is yeah. awesomer, okay? Yeah. But because it gets down to the nitty-gritty of what the what the spiritual way of life really is, Steve. So let's go back and review uh, this part four. Let's review our last week's study just briefly, uh, beginning in point C. The church age believer cannot account for his thoughts, motives, decisions, and actions in undefinable terms. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the importance of vocabulary and categorical storage in your soul stream of consciousness, the mentality of the soul. You yeah, see, the soul stream is, of consciousness yeah. is the mentality of the soul. Mm -hmm. And we're actually talking about the dispensation in which we now live, which is the church age. Mm -hmm. And we're focusing in on believers. Mm -hmm. And what we need to realize is that God has a plan for our life. We choose to call it the protocol plan because every born-again Christian is royalty. Mm -hmm. And royalty lives by a system of protocol. We're royal priests and royal ambassadors. Royal priests represent ourselves before God. That's vertical. And uh, royal ambassadors represent God before a fellow man. That's horizontal. So as royalty, we live by a system of protocol, and we live in a spiritual palace, a royal palace, which is called the sphere of the spirit. Now, with that in mind, we're actually talking then about the importance in a, in a believer's life. You, don't, you can't just get saved and stay dumb all your life. You know, get saved and wait for the sweet by and by. No, God has a plan for our life after we get saved. You have to get saved, and the plan begins at that point in time. We've already received everything we need at the point of salvation. The question is, are we going to learn what it is mm -hmm. and use it? So, important to the Christian way of life. You can't have terminology, you know, salvation, heaven, hell, sanctification, uh, positional sanctification, righteousness. You can't have terms that are undefinable. We have to know what they mean. So what we need as born-again Christians, we actually need vocabulary, that's words, mm -hmm. that are going to be related to the plan of God, and categorical storage in our stream of consciousness. Now, let's stop and, and talk for just a moment because we've used two phrases, vocabulary mm -hmm. and categorical storage. And we need to make sure that our listening audience understands exactly what we mean by these terms. By vocabulary, what are we talking about, Steve? Well, that's the terminology used to identify biblical concepts. For example, sin, mm -hmm. salvation, heaven, hell, giving, grace, etc. Yeah. Now, so th that's vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is with words, what we're doing is we're identifying certain concepts yes. found in the Bible. Now, while you have a vocabulary term, then the next question is, well, what is this I, this thing called categorical storage? And remember this, any pa any pastor, any evangelist can call, can use whatever terminology they desire to identify certain concepts found in the Bible. And one pastor 
doesn't need to make the terminology the same as mine because these are not necessarily words found in the Bible. These are words used to describe concepts that are found there. And so when you're talking about categorical storage as opposed to vocabulary, what is a category, Steve? Accumulated biblical data on separate subjects. Okay, there. Now stop, mm -hmm. let's stop right there. Think what you just said. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's 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 accumulated, accumulated data. So mm -hmm. what that means is you have a subject, for example, a vocabulary term, sin, salvation, heaven, hell, righteousness. The word baptism is used nine different ways in the Bible. The word die or dead or death is used several different ways. Now, when you're reading scripture, whether it's the King James Version, whether it's the NAS, the NASB, the, R, the RSV, whether it's a living letter, the message, it doesn't make any difference what it is. What you're going to do is you're going to be re you're going to be reading terms in mm -hmm. that in that scripture, and you need to know when you take when you start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation, and you take a term and draw all the information together on that particular subject, that term that's called a category of doctrine. Mm -hmm. So we have the cat we got the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of salvation, doctrine of righteousness, doctrine of justification. Does eh, eh, eh. so mm -hmm. many many doctrines found in the Word of God, which is an accumulation of data on that particular subject, okay? So let's talk for just a moment about the protocol plan of God, and by the way, <coughs> my throat is itching, so I'm going to be coughing a little bit, but I'm going to try to drink my way out of this thing <laughs> with water, okay? Yeah. <laughs> now, so here we go. We're going to talk about the protocol plan of God, so go ahead, Steve. The protocol plan of God demands that biblical theology be understood according to a strict application or interpretation of the law or the rule. Okay, stop right here. Can't be wishy-washy. No, the, the pro, there is a protocol plan. The protocol plan is for royalty. We're royalty, okay? So God has a protocol plan for us, and if you're going to be try, you're going to try to understand what this spiritual life is all about, which begins with salvation, the protocol plan demands that our biblical theology our theology from the Word of God, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, uh, soteriology, ecclesiology, uh, eschatology, pneumatology, what are all these ologies out there? <laughs> By the way, I know what they are. Yeah. But uh, with all those ologies, uh, they need to be understood according, watch this, according to a strict application or interpretation of the laws or rules of interpretation. You just don't walk into the Bible and say, oh yeah, sure, I know what this means, and away you go, and you're out there helter-skelter, you don't have a clue about what it's what it means, and you're out here coming up with uh, human viewpoint theology has nothing to do with reality. So understand this. Read that one more time, Steve. Hmm. The protocol plan of God demands the biblical theology be mm -hmm. understood according to a strict application or, or interpretation of the law or the rules. Absolutely. A strict application. So in other words, if you take the, if you take the rule here to interpret, say, Galatians 4.19, you don't take that rule and abandon it for over here in Colossians 3.4. No, it's a strict set of rules. And the tragedy of this is, is that many times Christians are told when they get saved, we'll give them a Bible. They'll say, what kind of Bible do I need? So you give them the name of a Bible. What's your favorite? King James Version, the message, ah, whatever it is. And they send them out there to get it and say, now you need to get on a Bible, on a Bible reading plan. You read through the Bible in a year and you got this plan. They, listen, when they're done reading that thing, all they have is an historical picture of what took place they don't understand straight up of what about what spiritual truth is or what the protocol plan is the plan of god for your life they have no clue preachers are in here taught tell them what to do without the how to do it and they can't figure out why they're so confused in life and why everything's falling apart doesn't make any sense so what we need to realize is, is that we're going to, we're going to interpret the word of God. And, in, and by the way, I mean, no big deal. I, I mean, yeah, I've been to seminary. I have a bachelor's degree. I've got a master's. I've got a doctorate and beyond that. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that until you're studying the right thing, God, God has given the church the universal church, he's given spiritual gifts to the church, one of which is a pastor teacher. The pastor is a shepherd of the flock, and he shepherds the flock by 
feeding them in that deep. <laughs> you you feed the, the feed the With sheep. The word of God. So you're not now, and, and the sad part here is, is that many pastors don't have a clue about what's going on. So they they're evangelizing the saved Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and the and the the lost are on the street somewhere. They're not in the church, okay? Or at best, like you said, tell them what to do, but not how to do it. What to do without? The, I call it what without the how. Yes. Mm -hmm. So here again, the protocol plan it must be interpreted. On, with a strict set of rules, okay? Now, point number two here. Unless metabolized doctrine taught is no more than gnosis information that never reaches the flat line. Okay, now hold on. We've got some, see, this is some, this, it is, no problem. Okay, this yeah. is some of my terminology mm -hmm. here, okay? So, unless metabolized, what do you mean by metabolized? Take it in and process it, digest it, you know, so. Okay, so we're going to take in the Word of God, but okay, so you put it in your mouth. Process it. it. No, process it. yes. So, so if you put it in your mouth, you're not processing it. Mm -hmm. You have to masticate. You ha you have to chew it up. Mm -hmm. You got to swallow it. It goes into the, into the stomach. It begins to be digested. It's broken down into its component parts. It goes through the intestines. The body absorbs it. Hey, you've got food that strengthens the body. So what happens is when you're metabolizing doctrine, where how does it get into how does it get into your frame of reference, Steve? Three ways: the ear gate, the eye gate, or tactically for oh. the deaf and blind. Okay, so it's coming in. Mm -hmm. The preachers, the pastors. Right teaching the the word of God. Okay. Yeah. And it comes through the ear gate, I get tactically. Where does it go? It goes into the, the F slash R frame of reference. Into the frame of reference. Now, when you meet two conditions, it's going to go down to the human spirit. What are the two conditions? You claim before the Lord and have a desire to know the truth. Claim before the Lord and have a desire to know the truth. Down into the human spirit it goes. The Holy Spirit does his work. There are three things that he does. He confirms the truth. He teaches the truth, and he bears witness to the truth. Thank you very much. And when he does that, it goes back up into the right. frame of reference, mm -hmm. and you have to do what? Make a decision. And what's the decision? You know it. Now do you believe it? Do you believe it? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, then gnosis knowledge Become. becomes what? Epinosis. Epinosis, which is full, full knowledge. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so what we've seen here now, now the issue, though, is if all you're doing is sitting there and hearing the mm -hmm. Word of God, you're not processing it. All you have is gnosis information because what? Well, and by the way, F L O T. What is that? Flat line of troops. Uh, no. Forward line of troops. Forward. It's yeah. Forward line, line of, of troops. troops. In other words, your defense as a born again Christian against the world of flesh and the devil begins with the ten problem solving devices. We've talked about those. We've exegeted them. We we've exposited them. We know what they are. So you have to get the the, the ten problem solving devices on the on the flat line of the soul. Flat line, F-L-O-T is forward line of troops. Now what you've got to do is get them, get them to where you can use them up on the front lines of battle. So unless metabolized, you got to take it in, you got to process it, and get it down, you got to get it to a certain spot in your soul in order to be able to be used. So what we're saying here is unless you have metabolized doctrine that is taught, mm -hmm. it's no more than, mm -hmm. it's no more that should be then no more than gnosis information that never reaches the flat line. And what I have here is a picture of a congregation sitting here. You got the preacher standing at the pulpit and he's communicating. Now watch this. When he's communicating, what is he communicating? What kind of knowledge? No, gnosis. It's gnosis information. It's no more than academic information coming out of his mouth. Now it's biblical truth, and there's power in the word. We already said that. The word of God is alive and powerful, but when it comes from the preacher's mouth down to the congregation, if all they do is sit there like a bump on a log, they're, they're you know, they're fiddling around, they're going to go to the bathroom, they're looking in a purse, uh, they're getting their kids settled down or whatever, they're missing most of what's being said. But what they need, you need to realize is what he's giving you is academic information coming from the Bible. It's biblical truth. It's powerful. But it's no more than academic information until it's used properly, okay? So just, so what we've got here then is the pastor is giving gnosis information to the congregation, and they have to metabolize it. Otherwise, gnosis plus pneumaticus, that pneumaticus is what the Holy Spirit does in the human spirit when he, when he bears witness, he teaches, he confirms the gnosis information in the, human, in the human spirit, sends it back up to the frame of reference again that is 
It's Gnosis plus Pneumaticus, and when you believe it, it becomes full knowledge that goes where? It, now, let's, you remember where it goes? Go but, the, into the new man clothes closet. Into the new man or the new woman clothes closet. Oh, yeah. Okay, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's a ma- man that goes into your clothes closet. Woman goes into your clothes closet. <laughs> yeah. Now, what happens is it can stay there. You can go out to, you can go out to men's warehouse. Mm-hmm. You can go out to somebody else. You can go to Dillard's. You can go someplace as a clothing store. You can buy all these clothes and bring them home and put them in a closet. And guess what? Never use them. Mm-hmm. Never use them. You just wear your blue jeans all day long. So the queen calls you. The king call. The king calls you. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> see, you, you you get called to the banquet and you go in your blue jeans. Why? You forgot to take the stuff out of your clothes closet. To you put had it. On. it. You yeah, got it. Yeah. That's right. You have it because you've processed it all the way to the clothes closet. But you're going to have to get it out of there so that you can actually use it. So let's start here. We'll start here tonight. This is where we begin after the review. Now, let's talk about this. Go ahead. Consistent exposure to expository teaching of the Word of God provides vocabulary for divine viewpoint in your stream of consciousness. <laughs> That's the mentality of the soul. Sorry about that. Just check that. That may be God calling. <laughs> no, it's a... It's a You're going to shut it off. Shut it off somehow here. Hang on. Sorry about that. People. Okay, that's yeah. well. It happens. So we'll okay. read it again. Just, no, yeah, but don't let it happen next week. Yeah. <laughs> oh gee. Okay. No, wow. go ahead. Yeah, let's read this again. And there are three words here. Just read it normally, mm-hmm. and then we'll go back and take a look at those three okay. words. Okay. Consistent exposure to expository teaching of the Word of God provides vocabulary for divine viewpoint in your stream of consciousness. That's the mentality of the soul. Okay. So here's the issue. You got the pastor up here. You get the picture up there. The pastor's preaching to the congregation, and when you when you enter into the congregation, time after time after time, you're there Sunday morning. You're there Monday Monday night. You're there Wednesday night. You're there for the week of revival, the extended revival time. You're there on Tuesday. You're there on Thursday. You're there on Friday. Whenever the Bible's being taught, you're there. Okay, that's consistent exposure. Mm-hmm to the expository teaching. Now, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make a a distinction between expository teaching and exegetical teaching and draw some conclusions here. But we're talking about expository teaching, and we're going to explain the difference between expository teaching and exegetical teaching, okay? Because both of those terms are important. So go back and read that one more time. Consistent exposure to expository teaching of the Word of God Provides the vocabulary. Okay, now, okay. Now, how are you going to get vocabulary? The, the consistent exposure. There, see. In other words, if you're going to if you're going to develop biblical you vocabulary, there, huh? you better show up to Bible class. Okay. So when you do that consistently, consistently, then when the pastor is expositorily teaching, you're going to develop. develop a, you're going to develop vocabulary. vocabulary. Oh, I see what that is. Sure enough, and you cycle that down into your stream of consciousness. And we'll talk about that. So God's going to provide. The Word of God's going to provide vocabulary for what kind of viewpoint? Divine viewpoint. Divine viewpoint. Not and what is viewpoint. divine viewpoint? God's thinking. That's the way that God thinks. That's His viewpoint. And quite honestly, God doesn't give a hoot what you think, <laughs> as long as what you think isn't what he thinks. We need to be able to think the way he thinks, and the only way to think the way he thinks is to get into the what? Word. Into the Word of God. That's exactly right. So you're going to develop vocabulary to support your divine viewpoint, and that's going to be housed where? In your stream of what? Stream of consciousness. And stream of consciousness. What that means, you're aware of something, okay? And the stream of consciousness is in the mentality of the soul, and specifically, it's going to be in the new man clothes closet, new woman clothes closet, and you're going to move it someplace where it can actually be used. Now, let's talk about exegetical teaching. We mentioned the word expository. Let's ter- let's use the term exegetical and see what that means. Exegetical teaching is technical. Going down to that spiritual Murfreesboro we refer to, and grammatically expository teaching is syntax and etymology. Okay, now do this. Read it, read it without without the parenthetical notes for just a second. Okay. Exegetical teaching is technical and grammatical expository teaching. Okay, stop right there. Yeah. So that's what it is. When you're talking about exegetical teaching, and the truth of the matter is, is you may you read that and you read it correctly, 
and maybe 2% of the people yeah, that you true. talk yeah. to out here. Now, the people online with this may understand, may and right. on Facebook may understand, but the people out there don't have a clue of what you said. What do you mean exegetical teaching is technical and grammatical expository teaching? <laughs> What in the world? Yeah. See, this is uh, this is why we're going down to spiritual Murfreesboro. We can't mess around in the in the superficial stuff yeah. and try to solve the difficult problems mm -hmm. of life. You're going to have to go down and get the gems yeah. out of the Word of God. Okay. Now, so with that in mind, then exegetical teaching is what? What's the T word? Technical. Technical and G word. Grammatical. Okay. It's technical expository teaching. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's grammatical expository teaching. And when you're talking about technical, that means you're going down in deep. And I call that going down to spiritual Murfreesboro. You're going to spiritual Murfreesboro to dig up some diamonds that are down in there deep. And the diamonds are those principles that come out of the Word of God that are going to help you to solve your problems every day. So technical, technical expository teaching and a grammatical expository uh, grammatical expository teaching now when you're teaching grammatically what are you going to do you're going to talk about what syntax and etymology okay when you're talking about syntax when you're studying the word of god and you, we should be the pastor should be studying it out of the greek and the new testament out of the hebrew and the old testament and what you're going to find out there is just more than a noun it's more than a verb it's more than a participle it's more than a gerund it's more than a, a, no you're going to have to understand something about this and so when you see that this thing happens to be a verb you have to ask yourself well what what uh, what is uh, uh, what is its tense? What is its mood? And what, what does what does all this mean? Okay, so you may have to say something when you read this in the English. This is what you're getting, but until you understand that this is a dramatic aorist, that this is a you know something that when you're when you're breaking this down, all of that means something, and that's what you're talking about when you're teaching grammatical grammatical expository teaching you're going to deal with syntax what does that mean you find a word in the greek language the word that you're talking about maybe at the beginning of a sentence oh that word at the beginning of the sentence means you're going to read this this way but if you take that same word and move it down four spaces and it's the fourth word that means it's going to it's syntactically it's different and that gives that verse different meaning you don't get that in the english you don't get that okay say, i like what you say about don't does, uh, when somebody says, I know the Word of God, say, I've read the Word of God and I know what it means. He said, I don't care what it, what it says. I want to know what it means. We're going to say that here yeah, in just a minute. Well, yeah. it, that's okay. That you're, so you're learning. It's so real. Because it's coming up again, it. see? Yeah. So now ex exegetical teaching is not only technical, but it's also grammatical expository teaching, which mm -hmm. deals with syntax. What are the, where, is, where is the word that you're talking about located mm -hmm. in the sentence? Etymologically means the derivation of the meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. So that when you're talking about the word baptism, for example, that word baptizo in the Greek, when you read it etymologically, you're going to go back many hundreds of years before Christ, and you're going to realize that that word actually means to identify. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, you're talking about the baptism of the cup, you're talking about the baptism of the believer, you're talking about the baptism of Jesus, talking about, excuse me, these words, these these words, the baptism of Moses, for example, that word means identified whatever it is you're talking about, mm -hmm. okay? And so uh, all of this has meaning for you, and that's etymology of the word, okay? So exegetical teaching is what? Right there? It is... Uh technical and grammatical expository teaching absolutely now let's go to the next page for a moment now let's talk about expository see we talked about exegetical teaching we teach isagogically categorically and exegetically okay now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about expository teaching because we're trying to identify the difference between one and the other well what is expository teaching it's the details the meaning of a verse or passage and do that again it means expository teaching means details, the meaning of a verse or passage. Okay, now it doesn't mean expository teaching details the okay. meaning. Yeah, see, it know. details. That word was bigger yeah, than that. No, no, that's okay. It details. See, I want see. I I did that. I emboldened that word and put it in capital letters because that's a crucial term. What happens when you're expository expository teaching? What you're going to do is to give the details of the meaning. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. See, and that's where that's where we're with the, the thing that you said just a few minutes ago is going to come up here right now. So expository teaching details what the meaning of the verse or passage. That's right. So you may be in a verse. And if you're expositing that verse, you're going to give the meaning of that verse, okay? Now, expository teaching not only details the meaning, it does what? Explains the meaning of what the Bible says. It explains, explains the meaning of what the Bible says. says. Mm -hmm. Now, watch this. So you have, it says this, it means this. And that's why I said here, let's assume that the pastor is talking right now. Mm -hmm. And what does he say? Because I say... Okay, uh, yeah, I know what it says there, Pastor. You, or you say to somebody, uh, well, what's the Bible say? He and you say, well, it says this. And they stop right there. And what they think, what it says, they think it means. And what I'm saying here, okay, so the pastor's speaking. He says, yes, I know what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But what? But this is what it means. See, <laughs> this is what it says, but this is what it means. Now, somebody might jump all over me jump all over you for making a statement like that, and they're going to say to me, wait a minute, do you mean that the Bible doesn't mean what it says? What I, what what part of what I said, You don't you understand? Mm -hmm. so there are times when what the Bible says, mm -hmm. it means. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be times when the Bible says something, it doesn't mean what it says. And I'm going to give you a clear example here. So the example here in Jesus is speaking. Mm -hmm. What do he say? He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, hang on. Oh, man, it means that. Oh, goodness. Now, now just a second. No, 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 okay, hang on. <laughs> hang on just a second. Read that one more time. Well, Jesus is speaking here. Mm -hmm. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Okay, so I have a question about that, Steve. And that question comes from... Uh, come from um, uh, John 6, 5, 655, and I asked the question. What am I asking? You're going to ask, ask him, uh, what did Jesus mean when he said? Uh, no, he, right here, right oh, there, oh, right there. Uh, it means to, uh, just read the whole thing. Does John 655 mean that to be in union with Christ, you must become a cannibal? <laughs> yeah. Now say that one more time without, without dramatics. Okay. Oh, uh, does John 655 mean that to be in union with Jesus, you have to become a cannibal? <laughs> See, he says here, he said, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Uh -huh. to, for us to be in him and he in us, that's union, okay? So we're asking here. See, you, you're in union with Christ the moment you become a born-again Christian, mm -hmm. out of Adam into Christ. Mm -hmm. You're now in union with Jesus Christ. So the question is, if you read John, uh, John uh, 655, does that mean you have to be a cannibal to become a Christian? Now, that's, that may, okay, that may be a stupid question. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, I'm trying to show that the Bible doesn't always mean what it says. Mm -hmm. And until we understand that, we could be in big trouble in terms of trying to understand the Word of God. Yeah, the translation in the English is not what it meant in the original. Well, right. Well, yeah, no, be, no, maybe. what? Yeah, but that may be so. Mm -hmm. But look here. This is the. This, this is, is a, this is a clear interpret a translation. It's a clear translation, not interpretation. Mm -hmm. It's a clear translation of what the Greek says. Mm -hmm. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood mm -hmm. dwelleth in me, and I in him. So even back then when it was written, they said that, but that's not what they meant either. Or what? Well, said. absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So it's not so, necessarily just all lost in some translation. No, not it's at all. That's all that's a per, that's a perfect translation. Yeah, Jesus, I can hear Jesus saying that in meaning. For them okay, to now think. hold on. Don't say what it means. We're okay. going to say what it means here in just yeah. a minute. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So the question is: Does this mean that to be in union with Christ, you <laughs> must become a cannibal? No. Well, what's the answer? Here it no, is. No, no. Jesus is using a spiritual analogy that anticipates the church age. See, he's talking back in the mm -hmm. age of Israel. Oh, yeah. And, and he's talking forward. about, see, they weren't in union with Christ. There was no I such think, thing no. as union with Christ back in the age of Israel. Mm -hmm. So it's only when the church age begins that a, a, new, a new plan for we as born-again mm -hmm. Christians in the resolution of the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't value in the Old Testament. Yes, there is. But the truth of the matter is the, the, the guidelines for the Christian way of life, the rules for living in the Christian way of life, are found in the New Testament, beginning basically with Paul's writings in Roman, in Romans. Now watch this. 
this is this, Jesus is using an analogy. So what about this analogy? The phrase what? The phrase eating his flesh and drinking his blood is analogous to manifesting faith in Jesus Christ. So when you eat of his flesh, what you're doing is you're you're manifesting faith in that person. Mm -hmm. When you talk about when he talks about drinking my blood, that's an analogy again to manifesting faith in his in, in that person of Christ. So when he says eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, hey, I'm in you and you're in me. Well, it's not drinking his blood. It's not eating his flesh. It means when you have faith alone in Christ alone, you are in union with Christ at that point in time. So eating and drinking is simply a manifestation of your faith directed toward the object of Jesus Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what are the results of your faith in Christ? And we've got two here. Mm -hmm. Well, we are in him, okay, and he is in us. Where do you, how, how do you know that? From the verse before. What verse is it? Jo uh, uh, right there, where the, where the thing is. Yeah, John 6, 55. Okay, yes. so John Love 6, 55 it. tells you mm -hmm. that when you're in, you're in union with him, and we're going up here, see, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me. There dwelleth in me. So here's Jesus, and what happened? Take this. This is you, and put him in. There you go. See, you're in him. And what happens now is now this becomes you mm -hmm. and he's in you. Uh -huh. And that's union. There's union right there. Now we're going to make a comment about that because I think it's crucial to understand this next point as we move on. So what are the results of your faith in Christ? Two things. We are in him okay. and he is in us. Now stop and think about that because here again, it's, um, many of us as Christians are walking around with such superficial understanding that we're out here going through the motions. It's ritual without reality. But when you realize what it means to be in union with Jesus Christ and getting coming to the point where you're allowing him to live his life through mm -hmm. you, okay, mm -hmm. so that when people are looking at you, they see manifestations of Christ, mm -hmm. the way he thinks, the way he feels, the way he speaks, the way he acts, and the way he rationalizes, okay? So, uh, we are we're in him and he's in us. Now what happens then, I have a note here, because when you know that you're in him and he's in you, what does that do when you combine those two? This is organic connection with Christ. You are organically connected to Christ. Now I use an, a water oil mm. uh, illustration for connection, and I use water and dye to show organic connection. And the water and dye is is the is the illustration of the union of you and Christ. We are organically connected to Him. He is in us, and we are in Him. Now stop right there for just a moment. We said organic connection, okay? Now let's stop for just a moment and go back over this thing about expository teaching. Go ahead. Expository teaching may not teach exegetically. Stop right there. So you may be, so what, what it amounts to is you may have a pastor who's teaching expositorily. Now what happens is when you go out to the racetrack and you're teaching, I don't know, uh, let's just assume for a moment that you're not out there, uh, you're not out there confusing your audience for a half an hour, talking about Aristacta participles, mm -hmm. and you're not talking about PL stems in a Hebrew, none of that. What you're doing is reading the scripture and explaining it to him. Oh, you said yes. that's expository teaching. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens, expository teaching may not teach exegetically. So that didn't make you wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're out there expositing the Word of God without exegeting it, mm -hmm. and read on from there then. But the pastor teacher's prior exegetical study will support his accurate exposition of this verse or passage or study. So what it amounts to is from, you know, from uh, uh, this this Sunday, uh, I finished finish teaching on Sunday morning, and I'm getting ready for next Sunday night, get ready for Monday night, get ready for Wednesday night, and I'm in my study. I'm studying exegetically to be able to find out what this passage means, not just what it says, so that when I can come to class and tell you what it means. Mm -hmm. And so it's, well, you're only telling us what it means. And, and I say sometimes when you're, ex when you're expositing the Word of God and someone says to you, now get that term, mm -hmm. when you're expositing the Word of God, not exegeting from right. grammar, the syntax, etc. You're expositing. So you're in class and you're telling, the yeah. telling people, this is what this verse means. See, you, I, you read it, you know what it says. I'm telling you this is what it means. 
What's a question that they might ask? Yeah. Hey, well, where did you get that? There you go. Yeah. Where do you get that? Yeah. Now, when they say, where do you get that? Then, then what you, you do is you go back to the exegetical study part. and show them yeah. how this isagogy categorically or exegetically, grammar, syntax, etymologically, means what it says. Like you said, you got an hour or two, I'll explain it all. That's yeah. exactly You've right. You've done that work yourself as a pastor. That's it. And here's the mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. A person sitting in the pew doesn't necessarily need the exegetical study to get the truth and for the Holy Spirit to confirm it. Oh, yes. So read that whole whole wow. point again. Exp expository teaching may not teach exegetically, but the pastor teacher's prior exegetical study will support his accurate exposition of the verse or passage. Support it. Yeah, yeah. See, see what I mean? So in other words, yeah. where do you get that? Well, here it is. I get it by, by doing this ex exegetical study. And I will explain it to you, but when I get done, you're probably not going to understand it anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what you can do is when the Holy Spirit well, confirms it, that mm -hmm. truth, you just know the that truth. you know uh -huh. that you know that this is truth. Know the truth will set you free. Absolutely. Now, wow. now what happens now that you now that you've uh, inhaled mm -hmm. this word, you have you have metabolized it. It's down. It's in your soul. You've you've got processed processed through the frame of reference, human spirit frame of reference. It's over the new man's clothes closet, and now you take it out of there and you place it on you place it on the, the conscious launching platform. But what I want you to understand right now, this next point. Where is the Word of God? It's in your new man or new woman's clothes closet. You've processed it all the way to the clothes closet. You own it. It's yours. You understand it. You believed it. It's It can be used if the right thing is done with it. That's why this next point says what? Believers must deploy their problem-solving devices resident in their soul. They must deploy them. Okay, so there's another there's another category another uh, um, another term vocabulary term. What's the guy? What in the world does he mean by deploy? He must deploy. Believers must deploy the problem-solving devices. All ten of them. As you learn them, they go into the new man clothes closet, new woman clothes closet, and guess what? You don't leave them there. You want to be able to use them, so you got to get them out of there and put them on the conscious launching platform, and that's called deploy. Mm -hmm. You got to get them where they can be used. You're not. You're back in boot camp. Mm -hmm. You've been instructed. You're waiting for orders, and bingo! Off to the front line you go. You're De your troops are being deployed, deployed okay? They can be used. That's exactly right. So go ahead one more time. Believers must deploy their problem solving devices resident in their own soul. Okay, now what we want to know is I eh, wonder what that means, see? Mm -hmm. So what does deploy mean? Deploy means to move your troops, the 10 problem solving devices, into position for military action. So what you're going to do, you've already taken them in. They're in the new man clothes closet, used new woman clothes closet. Right now, they're worthless to you mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. They have potential to be useful. Yeah, that's right. Employ you, them. They're, they're, they have potential, mm -hmm. but you can't use them as long as they're in the clothes closet. Right. You can't put you can't put right. it on. Right. Well, you could go in there, close the door, and hold it. And, you know, yeah, yeah, don't yeah, go there. Yeah. What we want is we want this stuff hanging out there where you can get it, mm -hmm. put Absolutely. it on, and drape yourself with it, okay? So what we're going to do now, we're going to deploy... The ten problem-solving devices to the to the flat line of the soul. Now, what does this mean to deploy? Go ahead. This means that you must take your your flat line, the forward line of troops, out of the new man or the new woman clothes closet, and place them on your conscience launching pad for the soul the soul's immediate use and application in the angelic conflict. Okay, now read that again without without the bra okay. without the brackets, okay? This means that you must take your flat line out of the soul, out of the out of, no, no, sorry, out of the new man. No, hold it hold it now. It doesn't say flat line. Read what's there. F L O T. What's that stand Forward for? line of troops. Okay, just say just, that. Just say that. Okay, it's that abbreviated means, here. Right? Yeah, but I know but you yeah. but you extended it. You said flat line. That's not flat line. That's forward flat. Line. Keep, okay. All that is a forward line of troops. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, that's okay. I'm, we're we're learning, okay? Flat starts with a F, so it was forward kind of. This Go means ahead. that you must take your forward line of troops out of the new man or the new woman clothes closet yes. and place them on the conscience launching pad of the soul for immediate use. That's the application in the angelic conflict. Like taking the soldier, putting him on the front line. That's exactly That's right. That's what it means, a front line, the forward line of troops. The ones are 
right out front in the action of the but spiritual see, battle. But see, flot forward line of troops can actually be back in the can be back in the background in the new man clothes closet. Mm -hmm. See, if they're about if they're uh, if deployed. they're in the if they're only in the new man clothes closet, which means you've actually learned it. It's it's mm -hmm. resonant in your soul, but you've got to get it to the spot in your soul mm -hmm. where in fact you can use it, mm -hmm. and it's not usable in the clothes closet where the clothes closet is mm -hmm. closed. Just like you those uh, troops are highly trained and expert, but they're sitting in a transport truck. They're That's not, exactly right. Yet, you know, but they're capable. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. So what we want to do is we want to get them to the conscious mm -hmm. launching platform, and the conscious launching platform is another term for the location where where doctrine is stored. stored. Where it is capable of being applied. being applied. Mm -hmm. See, in other words, for example, if you're going to if you're going to send a missile uh, in your in your military uh, military Maneuver. operation, mm -hmm. and you you want to de you want to actually send a missile off over there to 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 destroy the enemy, you'd better get it out. Of, you better get it out of the hangar, hangar. <laughs> and get on the launching. See, it's got to get on the launching uh -huh. pad because uh -huh. it's only usable when it's on the launching pad. And it doesn't happen accidentally. You have, have to, to take it out of there by a choice. Mm -hmm. See, God has made the provision. You have to use it. Mm -hmm. He's made the provision. I have to use it. He's made the provision. You and you and you have to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, with that in mind, then, read that thing one more time right uh, right here without without the uh, without the, the bracket. Okay? Go ahead. Right there. Right here. Okay. This means that you must take your forward line of troops out of the new man or the new woman clothes closet uh -huh. and place them on the conscious launching pad of the soul for immediate use in the angelic conflict. Okay, now let me ask you this. Uh, we're just, this is testing your knowledge, and it doesn't have to, they may not know it out here, but uh, most will. Uh, there is a conscious launching a platform, mm -hmm. and what else do you have? A subconscious. A launching. subconscious launching platform. On the conscious launching platform, you have to be aware of the circumstance on its way, and you have to make a decision as to what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. But when you have habituated it, you've applied it, applied it, applied it, applied it, applied it, it now moves to the subconscious launching platform, and when the circumstance comes, you don't have to think about a whip. Mm -hmm. You just, bingo, you have applied it. Mm -hmm. That's what that's that's why living the Christian way of life it becomes a habit to you. Okay, now notice this. You've just you've just read that statement, and what I have is a ta a table here that has a picture of the new man, new woman clothes closet. Now in that new man, new woman clothes closet, you have three categories of information. What's the B word? Well, you have your vocabulary. So what happens is when you consistently come to Bible class, mm -hmm. you're going to learn terminology. You're going to learn vocab vocabulary, so you can you can use Bible terms. Okay, now that you have those Bible terms, they're stored in your in your new man clothes closet, new woman clothes closet as vocabulary. So that when someone uses that, we say, "Oh yeah, I heard that before. I know what that is." Okay, but not only do you have vocabulary, you also have what categories? Categories a cat. A, a category, you've got the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of righteousness, the doctrine of holiness, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of eh, eh, eh. got all these doctrines, and they're stored in a separate section in your in your new man closet, new woman clothes closet, mm -hmm. as categories of doctrine. Now, there's one more thing that you have in your new man clothes closet. That's your, your conscience. Your conscience. Mm -hmm. And your conscience is your norms and standards. It's the moral norms and standards that you live by based upon the, the biblical truth of God's word. Now, what happens, your conscience needs to have needs to be out on the conscious launching platform so that when you make a decision about anything you will know whether you've done the right thing or the wrong thing based upon what you have ch what you've chosen to to believe as being true so that if you believe for example I want to ask you a question if in fact you believe that going to the movies is sinful what ha what happens to you when you go when you go to the movie? Your conscience tells you. Your conscience it, just, it condemns yeah, you. Yeah. But even when you may You're not wrong. be, even when you are not Correct. breaking a, a <laughs> it's just you've chosen to believe mm -hmm. that. Okay. So it's what you what you accept as being true well, is a is right. your norm and standard that's housed in your conscience. And when you violate your conscience. For example, eating meat off eating meat offered to idols. Mm -hmm. People think eating meat offered to an idol is sinful. Well, Paul knocked that in the head. 
No, an idol is nothing. So, okay, well, you get the idea. Mm. So what happens is you move, we've got arrows here. You move vocabulary, categories, and and your norms and standards where? Your conscience. To the launching conscience, pad. your conscious the launching pad. pad. Now, it you never go, you never, never go goes. from the new man or the new woman's clothes closet to the subconscious. Never. It goes out to the conscious launching platform. When the circumstance comes along, you have to apply the pertinent truth to that circumstance. And when you've done that X number of times, it's habituated and go to the subconscious mm -hmm. launching platform and you never have to consider that again. The difference is, like you said, in the conscious, you have to be alert and aware and make a decision. Yeah. When it's subconscious, you don't have to make decisions already automatic. That's exactly right. Now, what we want to ask ourselves right now is a question. Uh, we need to talk about ignorance, okay? Ignorance of doctrine. So how about this? Go ahead, Steve. Ignorance of Bible doctrine causes the reality of God's plan for your life to be hidden from you. Okay, now watch this. What causes yeah. what causes doctrine that is reality? What causes it to be hidden from you? Ignorance. Ignorance. So know. when you're ignorant of, it doesn't mean you don't have a high IQ. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you got a low IQ. Mm -hmm. It means you don't, you're mm -hmm. not you metabolizing know. the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You're not metabolizing the vocabulary. You're not building categories. You're not going to spiritual Murfreesboro. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But you don't have a clue about what God says about the protocol plan for your life, mm -hmm. which is exactly what God... Uh, why. That's his purpose for you now mm -hmm. that you're a born-again believer. So we've indicated ignorance then. Ignorance of what? Uh, God, ignorance right of Bible here. doctrine. Ignorance of Bible you don't doctrine. Know. You don't okay. Know now, if you're ignorant of Bible doctrine, that actually causes what? The reality, the reality of what? God's plan for your life to be hidden from you. So th there is there is a reality that God has a plan mm -hmm. for your life after you're saved. But if you're ignorant of Bible doctrine, you'll never know it. You'll never know the reality of that plan for your life. See, you you have a destiny in life. You have a destiny because you're born again. Mm -hmm. God has a destiny. The problem with many Christians is because they're not learning the Word of God, they have no personal sense of that destiny. What is my life all about? So what we've indicated here, I don't want you to see this. For those on Facebook and those on uh, on YouTube, you can't see you can't see the diagram, but of ignorance of Bible doctrine causes the reality of God's plan for your life to be hidden from you. So what I have is a picture of a Bible which is reality. And I've got a picture of somebody here with their eyes crossed and a big uh, question marks all over their all over their head yeah. and their mouth screwed up like this. And say, so this is the reality. And the person who's ignorant, when you're talking about the reality of God's word, they're going to say, huh, huh, what, what, huh? So I got a reality and a huh <laughs> here. And what I've indicated here in this box next door, read that. Most human beings, including Christians, live in the world of huh? when the spiritual side of Christianity is being taught. So when the when the Word of God is being taught. See, this is why many times when They're people ignorant. log on to us, they say, what in the world? I I don't stand with this guy saying, man, he is so, he is he's either deep, deep or dumb, you know, one or the other, because he's given me stuff I have never heard in all my life. I don't know how many times I hear that, Steve. That's why they're I, ignorant. I've <laughs> never heard anything like this in all my life. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go to church every week, and all you're getting is evangelized, no and you're re and somebody's reading the Bible to you, or you're reading it yourself, and it's not being explained. Guess what? You're not going to understand what God's plan is for your life, and it is a protocol plan. Okay. Now, with that in mind, again, I'm indicating here, and the reason I put that in red is because I added that to the notes after I sent the notes out to the folks okay. on um, in in Dropbox, and I added that. So I said, "Well, they said, well, I, I, that's not in my notes." Well, no, it's not, because I added it, and I just showed the added there. So here it is. Ignorance of Bible doctrine causes the reality of God's plan for your life to be hidden from you. Ignorance of the truth keeps it hidden from you. So reality is the Word of God, and I'm indicating most Christians and men, all unbelievers are walking around with, huh? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. huh? What are you, what's this guy talking about? I don't understand what he's talking about. So that's the huh life, okay? Now, without the reality, go ahead, Steve. Without the reality of metabolized doctrine circulating in the soul stream of consciousness, it's inevitable that sooner or later the believer will deny the who? existence who of is God. It? Yeah, the who believer. The believer, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's a believer. Will deny the existence of God the Father's protocol plan for his or her life. See, now that, hang on. See, now, now understand this. It's there a is a reality. Mm -hmm. The protocol plan is real. Yeah. 
-hmm. is found in the Word of God. But you need to be circulating that information from the printed page mm -hmm. all the way down to the new man clothes closet, new woman clothes closet, out on the conscious launching platform, waiting for a so circumstance to come along to make an application. But without the reality of that metabolized doctrine, guess what? It's inevitable that sooner or later, you as a believer will deny the existence of God the Father's plan. Because here's what happens. You go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday. Whenever you're going and all you're being is evangelized, you're not learning the, you're not learning the Word of God, guess what's going to happen? You'll just conclude that, you know, this thing about the Bible, it doesn't work. Hey, there, there's nothing in there for me. I guess I'm saved now. Praise God, I'm going to go to heaven. That's all there is. But, you know, that... So I'm just going to sit around and wait for it, to, for it to come by. But watch this. Remember Herbert Spencer? Mm -hmm. Herbert Spencer is a philosopher and other things. Mm -hmm. And he made a comment. Man, when I heard this, I.Q. Al-Razuli quoted this to me. <laughs> uh, man, that's, that is fantastic. And Herbert Spencer, if you'll just go out and Google him, here's what you're going to find out. For someone who, for someone who reacts to what you're telling. You're giving them biblical truth. You're giving them the truth. And they react. Well, that's not what I was told. That's not, that's not what I understand. Oh, I don't know. I don't think that's right. So what happens is what you're doing is you're reacting toward the truth coming to you rather than having an open mind and thinking through what you were told. And if after you thought it through, you still reject it because you can't agree with it because it doesn't match the Bible, throw it out. You're okay. But if, in fact, you react to what we're teaching, if you, react, if you react to the teaching of any pastor teacher who's giving you the Word of God, and you react because it does, that's not what I was taught, guess what? Herbert Spencer says contempt prior to investigation, and that contempt is when you're reacting. You're saying, no, 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 that's not what, no, hold on. no, that's reaction. So contempt prior to investigation. What did the Bereans do in the book of Acts? They went home after they were taught, mm -hmm. taught the Word of God. The they went home and searched the Scripture daily to find out whether or not what they were told was true. Mm -hmm. See, they had an open mind. Mm -hmm. So what I, we're indicating is contempt prior to investigation will keep a person eternally mm -hmm. ignorant. Mm -hmm. There it is. Mm -hmm. So with it, without the reality of metabolized doctrine that's circulating in your soul, guess what? It's inevitable that sooner or later you're going to deny the existence of God God's plan for your life. Now let's we talk, we keep talking about protocol plan, and I we oftentimes quote this. I quote it in Bible class, but I want to go ahead and, and read this uh, uh, read this. And what we're going to do in the last uh, last uh, 25 minutes, 24 minutes, we're going to tear this thing apart and explain exactly what it means. Listen, don't 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 go away, don't go away. This is going to help you to understand what this protocol plan is. I don't know whether we can do. I don't know whether we can finish this next 25 minutes, Steve. But we're going to give it a shot, okay? We don't want to hurry through it, but we want to explain what do we mean by protocol when we say God the Father has a protocol plan for you because your royalty and royalty lives by protocol. So let's define royalty, a uh, protocol rather, and we're going to have to go to the next page to get the rest of it. So let's go ahead. Protocol is a rigid, long-established code and procedure prescribing complete deference to superiority, power, no, no, uh, ranking. No, come back. Prescribing complete what now? Complete deference to superior power and authority, followed by strict adherence to due process, to, to due order and pro precedence, coupled with a precisely correct procedure. See, so it. No, for many, it's, no, this deal. For, no, for many, it's difficult to read, let alone understand. Yeah, yeah. So here's the issue, without reading it. Protocol is a rigid, long-established code, mm -hmm. prescribing complete deference to superior rank and authority, followed by strict adherence to due order precedence, coupled with a precisely correct procedure. That's what protocol is. Mm -hmm. Someone said, okay, well, and it, well, yeah, oh, I heard that. Well, what's it mean? We're going to well, dissect that, it right so now. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to dissect here this. We go. And here, watch this. As we go down through this, mm -hmm. the bullet point, the, the round bullet point, mm -hmm. is actually the, word. the words that are in the, no. in the, in the code, okay? Mm -hmm. 
But what happens, we're going to explain Man. each one of those, and sometimes that's going to need to explain, mm -hmm. and that's going to need to explain. So we may, we may have as many as four bullet points uh, deep into this thing, okay? Force the word. Yeah. That's exactly right. So let's start with the first one. What is it? first one is it's a rigid code. So, Protocol is a religion, a, a, a rigid code, yeah, a, ri a rigid, rigid code. code. Now, the question is, what do we mean by rigid, rigid. code? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? The code is the divine system for the utilization of God's power, whereby every church age believer is able to glorify God. Okay, so God wow. is a plan whereby you're able to glorify him. Wow. You as a believer. Uh -huh. Now, the truth of the matter is, is you can't, you can't, you can't glorify him if you don't know no, what the plan is. Exactly. And the plan is rigid. What's that mean, rigid? It means it doesn't bend, it doesn't break, and God's not interested in you telling him what the plan happened to be if it doesn't match what he says. It is what it is and nothing else. That's right. And this is why today many Christians, and I, I say this as kindly as possible, with all humility, but the truth of the matter is it's tragic how many Christians today don't have a good understanding of the Word of God. Now let me point out something. You don't have to use the terms that I use. Use your own terms, but don't mess up the concept mm -hmm. behind the term found in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So the protocol plan of God is a rigid code, meaning the, by the word code. What do you mean by code? That code is the divine system for the utilization of God's power. God has power. When we go down in, we're going to find out what that power is. Mm -hmm. But to use God's power, whereby a few church age believers, that right? no, no, no. Every. whereby every church age believer is able, able. to glorify God. Now you're able, able. you may they not be, them. but you are able to do that mm -hmm. if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, so a rigid then, a rigid code, but it's also protocol is a rigid, long established code. Mm -hmm. But what about this long established? What that belong? It's established the day. The church age began. So right. when you're looking back 2,000 years, mm -hmm. that's quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. So what it amounts to is this code that was given to us was given to us back when the church age began. So the Apostle Paul is going to come along and going to give us the plan of God. Now, hold it now. I understand. Don't go there. The Word of God is found in the Old Testament. Yes, I understand that. But the plan in the Old Testament was for Israel mm -hmm. and not for the church. Mm -hmm. And so when you're actually having a technical uh, a technical understanding of Bible theology, you'd better get dispensational in your theology because covenant theology won't cut it. Reformed theology won't cut it, okay? It's dispensational in nature. Mm -hmm. So it's a long established code that takes us all the way back when? When the day that the church age began. Okay, so we're going back to the church years. age to find out what this plan is, okay? Now, let's move on from there because not only is it long established, all the way back, what is it? Well, the code is God's game plan for the church age. So what happened in God's game plan for the church age, mm -hmm. God's game plan for the church, and by the way, I got that in quotes. We're not playing yeah, games, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, get a life, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the issue. It's God's plan It's uh, God's plan for the church age, established at the day it began. Mm -hmm. Now, the next term is what? A long established procedure. It's a longest, no, okay, but emphasize the last word. It's, it's a long, long established, established code, but it's also a long, long established, established procedure. procedure. Okay, when did the, when the procedure start? Uh, since the day the church age began. Okay, and what is the what is the procedure? The procedure is the proper execution of God the Father's plan. Okay, so he's got a code that started back mm -hmm. there. Got a, yeah, and now it, 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 there's a procedure, procedure which it. means there's a proper oh, way right. of doing this. Okay, now this is one again, Steve, where where I have been accused, and hey, I, I hear all that, it doesn't bother me, but I've been accused of uh, making the, the Word of God or the, the Christian way of life formulaic. There's a formula here. Well, I don't care what you call it. What we have here is a long-established code hmm. prescribing complete difference, etc. So it began on the day of uh, the day of uh, the church age began, and it's actually the long-established procedure is the procedure which is the proper execution. There is a right way to do this. Okay. Now the next phrase is what? Complete deference. Complete deference to rank. Superior rank. Okay, so complete deference to superior rank. What does that word deference mean? Respect. So what you have is this, it's a rigid, long-established code prescribing complete deference to superior rank. Complete respect, respect. for superior rank. Well, who is, let's talk about that, uh, the superior rank here. Go ahead, right there. Uh, 
respect uh, uh, respect for divine power. Okay, now stop right there. Uh -huh. So we're, we're complete deference, respect to superior yeah, rank, and who is that superior rank? God it's divine God. power. Mm -hmm. Respect for divine power, and most people rely on human strength. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do everything they're doing in the inner place. They're doing the right thing, etc., but the wrong way. Now let's mm -hmm. stop here. So it's respect for divine power. I want to ask you on, on Facebook. I want to ask you on, on YouTube. I want to ask you on website, WebEx. Do you have respect for divine power? Now, what is divine power? Because we're going to break that divine power into two different things. Divine power is found in the Word of God in two areas. What is it? The power of God, the Holy Spirit. And go back down and here. The power of the Word of God. Okay, so we have complete difference to superior rank. And that's respect here for divine power. And the divine power that we need to have respect for is for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the power of the Word of God. Two things. That's the power. Now watch this. When you're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, let's break that down into two parts. The power of the Holy Spirit means to be what? Filled in the sphere of the Spirit. Can it stop right there? To be filled where? In the sphere of the Spirit. Not to be filled with... Yes but to be filled in the sphere of the Spirit. Now, that may not be understood by many right now, people, yeah. mm -hmm. but that's okay. We explain it. Mm -hmm. It can be explained. We're, we're talking about not only what it says, but what it means. So when you have complete respect to superior power, to superior rank, you're respecting the divine power of the Holy Spirit. And when you're doing that, how, what does it mean to, do, to respect the divine power of the Holy Spirit? It means to be filled, to be filled in the sphere of the Spirit, and to be filled in the sphere of the Spirit. The question is, what are you being filled with? Well, the, the, the Bible indicates that the Spirit of God is going to fill you with Christ-likeness. As you metabolize the Word of God, you're going to find out what His characteristics are. Go back and take a look at the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. We have the characteristic of Christ. And so what he's going to do is as you metabolize the Word of God, you're going to learn how to manifest that ninefold characteristics. And so what happens when people are looking at you, what they see is Jesus in you. Wow. So respect for divine power, which it's not your human power, but you're respecting the power of the Holy Spirit. And in terms of being filled in the sphere of the Spirit, which is organic connection, the question is this. Let's take a look at this. So you're organically connected, and what does it mean to be organically connected? Now look, he's going to read this to you, but when you read it, don't throw it out. You may have to come back and metabolize. You're going to have to ponder this. You're going to have to think about this because there's a, there's a concept here of being filled with, mm -hmm. in the sphere of the Spirit, which is actually, uh, it actually it's, it's a passive voice, the passive voice in both instances where somebody is receiving something. You're not doing anything. You're receiving it. So the question is being filled in the sphere of the Spirit. What are the two terms? Absorption and infusion. Okay, absorption and infusion. So in other words, in this organic union, not listen, not only are we organically connected to Christ at the moment of salvation, when you learn to function in the sphere of the Spirit, you are organically connected to the Holy Spirit. And what that means is he's in you and you're in him. And it, does, it it's uh, uh, the, uh, the concept that epitomizes how this takes place is absorption and infusion. So in absorption, if you're filled in the sphere of the Spirit, what does absorption mean? That the Holy Spirit is absorbed <coughs> by the believer. You absorb, Here, you, <coughs> excuse me. Here you are. You make a decision to enter the sphere of the Spirit. And you do that through Operation Cry. No reckon, reckon, and yield. When you yield, you yield. Act of voice. You are the one that's yielding. But the, the minute you jump into the pool, you get soaked, okay? Mm -hmm. The minute you jump and the minute you move into the sphere of the Spirit, there is a divine process that takes place, and that is where you absorb the Holy Spirit. He, didn't, he doesn't do anything. He's wait, He's there waiting. He's like the water in the pool waiting for you to jump in to get wet. Or like the glass where the dye goes into it. The dye goes in it. it the water is, is the water is absorbed. It's, ab it's absorbing, and that's mm -hmm. exactly right. Mm -hmm. So if you throw if you throw a, a dry towel into a glass of water, that water that water doesn't jump out jump onto the no. onto the towel, no. the under the cloth. 
the cloth absorbs it. Mm -hmm. So the water didn't have to do anything but be there mm -hmm. until they threw the towel in there. Exactly. See? And if you if, and sometimes if you want to demonstrate this, make sure that you've done this with a towel that's the right size and the right amount yeah, of water. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens is when you do that, you drop the water the towel down in the water or the cloth down in the water, it absorbs all the I mean, there's not another drop of water left in a glass, and the and the and the rag is totally wet. Mm -hmm. So what's happened? There's been absorption and infusion. Mm -hmm. See, that's passive action on both on both parts. Mm -hmm. So when you are when you make the decision to enter the sphere of the spirit by yielding to Him, then what happens is absorption and infusion take place. And absorption is you make the decision to enter the sphere of the spirit, and you then absorb the Holy Spirit as absorbed by you. Mm -hmm. You did the action to get in there, and then what happens? He just Passively infuse, uh, yeah. absorb you absorb me. Now the other term is have. infusion. Mm -hmm. that, that is the believer is infused with the Holy Spirit. That's right. And see, you didn't do anything except get in there, and what happens? Is the Holy Spirit then infuses you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you absorb, and he and he infuses. So what happens now when that happens? We have a union like this, an organic union. It's not Holy Spirit here and you here. Mm -hmm. No, no. It's this way. You are you are one, uh, the same. one the same. You are organically connected, mm -hmm. and that is where the power of the Spirit mm -hmm. takes place mm -hmm. in your life. And you can't do that until you have the power of the Word of God to know what to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> now, what happens then? Notice here. So here's we have uh, complete deference to superior rank. You're 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 uh, you're respecting the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God. You've, absor you've been absorbing and infused here. And now what happens is you have, you're filled in the sphere of the Spirit. And the second thing is what? You walk by means you of the Spirit. You walk by means of the Spirit. So you're filled in the sphere of the Spirit with the Holy Spirit, organically connected. And then once you're there, you walk by means of the Spirit. Now that means you, what walking by means of the Spirit means you're walking, you are actually applying in the sphere of the Spirit. Now what happens is, what we need to do here then is to see nine different nine different walks. The New Testament talks about walking in nine different ways. Wow. So what we want to know categorically, mm -hmm. which categorically, we have a term, walking. Oh. Now what we have is a category mm -hmm. about walking, mm -hmm. and what we want to do is to explore that for just a moment. So let's go get let's go get that. And here are nine different walks in the New Testament. First of all, what is it? Walk in the newness of life. You're going to walk in newness, newness of life. life. Would you read the passage that supports that? Sure, it's Romans 6, 4. <clears throat> Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. See, we're going to walk in, in newness, newness of life. life. Now, what, ha what does that mean, to walk in newness of life? It means we walk into a supernatural life. See, what you're doing, you're coming out of the flesh. flesh you're coming out of Adam, the unbelief, and you're walking into a supernatural life. Mm -hmm. God has a supernatural life for you, mm -hmm. but you have to know how to execute it, okay? Mm -hmm. So notice this. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism <clears throat> into his death. That's not water baptism. You're That's spirit baptism. It, that's You're identified with his spirit. With his spiritual death, okay, so that eventually you die with him, you buried with him, you resurrected with him, okay. And when you're resurrected, that's not res physical resurrection. This spiritual resurrection, where you come into brand new life, it's a spiritual life. So first of all, you walk in newness of life. Point number two, walk worthy of the vocation. So not only walking in newness of life, we're going to walk worthy, worthy of, of the vocation. vocation. Where what supports that? Ephesians four one. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the, of the vocation wherewith you were called. See, we're not we're not walking worthy of the vacation. It's, it is worthy of the vocation. You mm -hmm. read that right. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, our voca what is our vocation? Our vocation is to represent Christ. Thank you very much. And you don't represent him simply by calling yourself a Christian. No. You're representing him by, uh, by actually executing his character in every circumstance of life. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, what's the third walk? Well, uh, well, walk worthy of the Lord. Okay, what's the what's the support? Colossians 1.10 That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, 
and increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay, so walk worthy of the Lord. Let's find out what does that mean. This is walking that produces results. <laughs> yeah. Not to go around in circles. You're see, yeah, see you're, you're producing re results. So watch this. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful Ooh. in every good work. See, what that means is you're producing, producing. in the Christian way of life. Good <clears throat> now, what about number four? Uh, walking honestly as in the day. Okay. How, what supports it? Romans 13, 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Mm -hmm. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. So you're going to walk honestly. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It, this is the result of function within the sphere of the Spirit. So when you learn how, see, it's a precisely correct yeah. procedure, so that when you learn how to walk in the sphere of the Spirit, and you have the power of the Spirit, you're organically connected. Now you're what you're doing is you're executing the Word of God, which is power, and you're you're ex executing it, and you're having impact out there in life because of the power and because you knew what to do and how to go about doing it, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is function. Walking honestly in the day is actually the result of functioning in the sphere of the Spirit. What's the next one? Walk in good works. Okay, and let's see, let's find out, walk in good works, what that means. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, mm -hmm. which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So what are we going to do? We're, we're going to walk in good works. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what does that mean? A walk should result in divinely good works. So whatever you're doing when you're walking in the Christian way of life, you could be walking in the sphere of the flesh, you could be walking in the sphere of the spirit. But when you're walking in the sphere of the spirit, mm -hmm. guess what? Mm -hmm. You should be, now you will be then, but the idea is now that you're born again Christian, you should, should be, be. You should be producing divinely, divinely good, good works. And the divinely human. good works are going to be blessing in time, and it's going to be, you have distributed for it at the beam of seat, you're going to have uh, rewards distributed there. Now, this, number six is what? Walk by faith. And, uh, and this this is a very good verse here. Okay. Second Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's right. I love that verse. Now, and here's the issue. When you're walking by faith, what that means, you're applying. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing? What you're doing is you're applying faith to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Faith demands an object. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what vocabulary term, what category of doctrine, what principle, what promise, what doctrine, what technique, what rule for living are you applying mm -hmm. to your to the Christian way of life that might give you impact mm -hmm. and glorifying God? So when you walk by faith, that simply means you're executing the faith rest drill. So when you find yourself in an adverse situation, what you're going to do is to claim a promise to get out of a spiritual tailspin. You come out with a promise. Now what you're going to do is develop a doctrinal rationale and apply that doctrinal rationale to the circumstance of life, and you're going to take control of the circumstance to glorify God. Now the next one is walk what? Walk in love. Walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ hath also loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk in love. Mm -hmm. And this is the production of what? Of, of impact from the function of the sphere of, sphere of the Spirit. So when you're functioning again in the sphere of the Spirit, and you're going to be producing good works, guess what? You have impact, impact. out there. Uh -huh. And there's several, you know, there, there's several types mm -hmm. of impact. Mm -hmm. yes. You have impact on your own life. You have impact on your heritage. You've got impact nationally. You've got Historical. impact historically. And you got impact on angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the next point is walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Now what does uh, what verse backs this Galatians up? Galatians five sixteen backs it up. This I say then, walk in the spirit, that ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay. Now what does that mean to walk in the spirit? Mm -hmm. This refers to residence in the sphere of the spirit. So in other words, when you're walking in the spirit. You're walking in the sphere of the Spirit. You can't walk in the sphere of the Spirit if you don't know how to get there. Right. Here. Okay? It's a precisely correct procedure. We're commanded okay. to walk in it. That's right. Now, point nine, this is the last one. This walk one. in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. To Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So you walk in wisdom toward those that are without. That means you're walking in wisdom mm -hmm. Toward the unbeliever. The unbeliever, you, you need to be walking in such a way that you're presenting wisdom to the unbeliever and redeeming the time. You're making every second count. You're making every minute count. Now, what does it mean then? 
So walk in wisdom. Go ahead. Live the Christian life with the application of doctrine to experience. See, that's wisdom. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is not what you know. It's not what you believe. Wisdom is what you're doing. So that when you do the right thing in the right way, guess what? You're a wise individual. Now, let's go back here because we only got uh, a minute and 45 seconds, which means it's time to close this out. But we'll go back and see where we are. And uh, what we'll do is we'll come back here next next week and we'll just we'll just read the protocol plan of God again. We'll not go through all this this uh, what we've explained, but we'll pick up here with the complete difference to superior rank and authority and explain what all that means. These notes are available. There are notes available in my time in my Dropbox. They're available to you if you don't have Dropbox, you don't know how to get Dropbox, you get in touch with me, email me, I'll send them to you so that you can take time to reflect on this, to make it a part of your life. This is the difference between reality and unreality. <laughs> Go ahead and pray for us, Steve. Father, we thank you for this study. We thank you that your plan is is a is a perfectly designed plan it's not wishy-washy it's not what someone thinks it's your plan for our life and father in doing so and living this life by applying the principles and the word and the yes. spirit, of the spirit we give credibility to our witnesses like our dr jim said yes. those unbelievers see us yes. uh functioning this way and uh that may lead them towards a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Or for those believers who've, set, uh, who've gone astray or not following your plan, sure. to see it working can give credibility to the, the fact that it's real and yeah. it works. And that's what it's all about, resolving the angelic conflict. Thank you, Father, for this awesome study and the details and those gems that are down there to dig mm -hmm. out yes. so we can use them to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Jesus, blessed night. Amen. Amen. Now let's take a look and see who's with us on, on Facebook here. And um, let's see who we got. Let's see if I can do this without yeah, without flipping it without, up. Yeah, yeah, without getting okay. them all down here. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, Kurt Kent Ressler, this is a very small print. Kent Ressler is watching. Thank you, Ke uh, uh, Kent, Kurt, or Kurt, Kurt rather. Kurt, Kurt. And my my friend, evangelist, uh, pastor, teacher, really, uh, Buddy Fisher. Mm -hmm. Buddy was the uh, the past president of the Arkansas okay. Pastor, a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine. Uh, he said, blessing, Dr. J. Buddy. Uh, okay, Wilma Bonds is watching from the hospital. Thank you so much, Wilma. God bless you, and we prayed for you. Hope you get well very, very quick, okay? Then uh, Rhoda Pedras is on with us from uh, Davao City, Mindanao. Uh, Justin Boyd is on with us uh, from, uh, from uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sandra Malone is on with us from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, Hot Springs, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Sandra Malone. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Sandra there again. And uh, Dorothy Staggs and um, her husband Kendall from Whitehall, Arkansas. Uh, Lori, uh, Lori Gallo Nieto, that's from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Buddy Fisher again. Bobby Davis from Little Rock, Arkansas. Dennis Ball from Bigelow, Arkansas. Uh, Mary, Mary Lewis, Mary, I'm not sure where you are. I just keep saying you're traveling with your with your husband. God bless you. Appreciate it. Eddie Gallo from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, Maris, uh, Maris Kaysen, uh, Maris Smith Kaysen. The, Maris, my, my children grew up together in Stuttgart, Arkansas. Wonderful, wonderful family. Beautiful young lady. Um, thank you, Maris, for being with us tonight, okay? Boy Smith is on with us from Trustville, Alabama. Uh, Eddie Gallo, again, uh, from Las Vegas, says, Hi, Dr. Jim and Pastor Steve. Good evening. Always great, amazing, ultimate information mm -hmm. here, uh, here for, for you, okay? Then let's see, uh, Connie McGowan. Thank you, Connie. Connie is a, a beautiful uh, lady whose husband is a pastor here in this area. Uh, Cliff McGowan. The, uh, Connie worked with Janet at FIS at, at Systematics. And uh, let's see... Um, Rhoda Pedras, again from Davao City, Mindanao. Some of these are repeats here. And um, let's see. Yeah, these are repeats. Uh, William Watson. Thank you, Bill. I'm not sure where you're from, but thank you for being with me. Okay, that's that's the folks that are on with us on Facebook. God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll be back again Sunday morning. Now let me let's let this go and let's see just uh, who's on line with us up here on on uh, Webex. My son Brian Bertel, thank you so much, son, for being with me tonight. God bless you. I love you to death. 
Dennis and Dawn Ball from Eagle, Arkansas. My wife, ooh, I love her too. She's from <laughs> here at the house. That? Yeah, Karen Torrance from um, uh, from uh, BB, BB, Arkansas. Uh, let's see twice there. Cat Kennedy and her husband um, Henry from New Chesney, Texas. Uh, Kim Williams from Little Rock, Arkansas. My daughter Leanne in the house. Uh, Richard Nita Clark from Little Rock, Roger Lamuco from Davos City, Minnow, and the Barnell family from Antioch, Antioch, Arkansas. God bless all of you, and good night. We'll be back Sunday morning from right here in the shack in the back. <laughs> okay? Thank you. Good day. We, we got we've got to stop oh, this one too. That one too yeah.